very glad to be here. Uh, quite frankly, this evening, I consider it my Father's Day gift. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, and she mentioned my three daughters. Now, you know their mom had something to do with that too, right? <laughs> but it is Father's Day, so we talk about what dads do. But I, I do have uh, three daughters of which I'm very proud, uh, Laini, who is a uh, nurse. She works at Cooper Hospital in Camden and University in Philadelphia. My daughter, Nia, who recently got married. She's no longer Nia Ham. She's <laughs> Nia Clark. <laughs> She's Nia Clark now, yes. And, and you know, she was married. Uh, a part of the wedding ceremony was at the home of Langston Hughes oh. in Harlem. Yes, wow. yes. I think I had posted a Facebook picture that some of you may have seen, but she married a wonderful young man, uh, Jason Clark. Uh, she couldn't have picked uh, a better uh, husband. And my youngest daughter, Imani, who has graduated uh, from Rutgers University two years ago and now works in state government and will be going to graduate school. So I'm very proud, proud of my three daughters. I'm very proud of them very much. Brothers and sisters, um, I was actually, let me just say a little bit about myself. Many of you don't know, but I was actually born in Washington, D.C. Yes, I was born in Washington, D.C. and brought to Newark as a baby and raised in Newark, New Jersey. I'm a product of public schools. I graduated from South 17th Street School. Uh, Went to Arts High School, graduated from Arts High School. Uh, it was in Arts High that I began as an activist. I guess the seeds of consciousness were planted when I was a youth. Uh, my mother was not an activist. I didn't come from a political family. I don't come from generations of activists. My father was a truck driver. He drove them big red Mack trucks with the silver bulldog on them. My mother was a seamstress. She worked at the Hoffman Eyes and Cleaners between 12th and 13th Street on 16th Avenue. I passed away when I was passed away when I was passed away when I was four years old. He's buried with my grandfather in the veterans section of Glendale Cemetery in Bloomfield, New Jersey. My grandfather, Claude Cobb, fought in World War I, and my father, Lawrence Ham, fought in My political consciousness rests is a sense of fairness that my mother and my family gave to me, that I should treat other people as I would want to be treated. When you have a firm foundation, the rest is not difficult, but you have to have a firm foundation. And although my mother wasn't a political activist, she helped to instill in me a sense of fairness. I think the first seed of consciousness was when, you know, I was one of these bad kids that they had to send down south every summer. Right. They don't do that anymore, right? But there was a time when it was a common practice for yeah, black families to send their children to the south, yeah, right, yeah. for the summer to get out of the city yeah. so they wouldn't get locked up. So in, I guess it was about 1961, we got on the Amtrak train in Penn Station in Newark. It was my mother, her sister Gladys, my grandmother's sister, Joan, and myself, we got on the train, the Silver Meteor. It's an Amtrak train. Yeah. It still runs today. Yeah, mm -hmm. And we got on in Newark, and then when we got to Union Station in Washington, D.C., the conductor came to us and said that we would have to move to the rear of the train. Why did that happen? Because Washington, D.C. sits on the Mason-Dixon yeah. line. And in those days before the end of apartheid in the United States, when you cross that line, the laws of segregated travel came into existence. I remember that event because, you know, you ever know how you have like two sisters or two brothers and they like night and day? Well, my mother was wonderful, the best mother I could ever have, but she was basically the kind of person that followed orders. But my Aunt Gladys, her sister, Lord have mercy. When that conductor told us 
<laughs> we was going to have to prove Gladys was not having it. And it was a big commotion on the train. But we didn't have enough money to get a second ticket because we would have been put off the train. We that I kind of, we had a little bit of discussion about. But the second thing was the uprising in Newark in 1967. I remember very clearly uh, where I was, what I was doing, and we were, I was at a friend's house and somebody ran upstairs and said, Springfield Avenue is on fire. And it was a group of, we all ran downstairs to run down to Springfield Avenue, but my mother was across the street on the porch. And she told me to get my butt home back across the street and she probably saved my life that night because no telling what would have happened if I'd have gone down Springfield Avenue. So, you know, back in those days, we had like a decentralized economy, right? If you lived in the neighborhood, everything was in the neighborhood. You had the drugstore, you had the vegetable store, you had the grocery store, you had the laundromat, might have had a couple of laundromats, you had the cleaners, you know, the candy store, everything. You had a clothing store and shoe store on 16th Avenue, three blocks from my house. So when the rebellion broke out, it was going on all around us. I lived at 527 South 12th Street. We were sitting on our second floor porch, looking out, and I asked my grandfather, I said, Papa, why is everybody so mad? Because you know what was going on. And my grandfather, who was not a political activist, he started talking about what he experienced in the army. He was in World War I, and he went to Europe. And he said, Bootsy, because that's what they called me when I was a little Because I like cowboy boots, you know, back in those days. He said, Bootsy, when I went to France, and he went to France to fight the Germans in World War I, to help the U.S. was trying to help the French. He said, when I went to France, and we got off the boat, and we went into the town, he said, the French people asked to see my tail because this was the stereotype, one of the many stereotypes of black people and African people, because you know the French had a long history of colonization in Africa. And so my grandfather, he started talking from his own experience. He wasn't a political scientist, he wasn't a professor. He started talking about his own experience. My grandfather was from Georgia and he hated the South. He hated the South. He told my mother that if he died and she put his body on the train, that he would get up off the train and come back and beat her behind. <laughs> my grandfather hated the South because he was a black man. He was a black man, a tall six foot, African-looking black man. So he probably experienced the worst of apartheid, of Jim Crow segregation in the South. So the rebellion of 67, my own experience with segregation, and then when I got to Arts High School, the week, the first week of Arts High School, freshman orientation. The whole assembly is in there, you know, orientation when they talk about the school. So the principal told the young man, he was a white young man, by the way, his name was David Hammond. He was the president of the student government of Arts High in 1967, in the fall of 1967. Said, David, come talk, about, come talk about the student government. So David comes to the podium and he starts to talk. But David doesn't talk about the student government. David starts talking about the war in Vietnam. Now, I was 13 years old at the time. I didn't know where Vietnam was. I had heard about Vietnam because it was on the news, and I knew it was something important, but I didn't have a lot of information. David starts talking about the war in Vietnam. The principal stood up and said, David, don't talk about the war in Vietnam. Talk about the student government. Talk about the Halloween party, the UNICEF collection and the student government. That's what he said, no, I'm not making this up, it's true. David kept talking. The principal went up to the podium and grabbed David and tried to pull him from the podium 
and my first week at high school, the student government president and the principal are fighting on the stage in front of the whole assembly. That's when I knew I wanted to be a student council representative. <laughs> It's true. That is a true story. I said, no. I didn't know all the details, but I said, I want to be a part of that. And I led my first walk out in, in March of 1971. And I've been fighting ever since. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to fight till the day I die. Let me tell you something. If I'm over there in the White House nursing home in Orange, and I'm on my last leg, I want you to put my old sick behind in a wheelchair and roll me to the nearest picket line because I want to die on the battlefield. I want to die on the battlefield. I don't want to go quietly into this dark night. I want to die the way I live. And I'm so glad I got to live to be 66 years old because so many things have happened and you know the life of black people, the lifespan of a black man is 10 years less than that of a white man, so I'm lucky to be, to make 66. But I wanna keep fighting. When I left Arts High School, I was appointed to the Newark Board of Education. I was the youngest school board member in the history of the country. You might remember that. I was appointed at the age of 17. I wasn't even old enough to vote. And I, would, I had been accepted at Princeton University that fall, the fall of 1971. And I started my school board term, but I had to leave Princeton because it was too much. I couldn't do both. Couldn't do both and do both well. So I left Princeton in 71 and came back home to serve full time as a school board member from 1971 to 1974. I was appointed by the first black mayor of Newark, mm -hmm. Kenneth A. Gibson, of which we are very proud. He made history. He's the first black mayor of a major East Coast city, and he appointed me to the Board of Education. I raised so much sand on the board that when my term was up, Ken Gibson said that was the worst appointment I ever made. <laughs> but um, it's true, that's what he said. And so I was not reappointed to the board, and I returned to Prince University in 1974, but I returned married and with a baby on the way. So I had been a track star. I was a state champion two-miler record holder, nine minute, 36 second record holder at that time in 1971. But married and with child on the way, I couldn't have the life of a regular student. I had to work and go to school. But I'm proud to say by the time I finished Princeton, married with a child, with all those responsibilities, I graduated cum laude from Princeton University in 1978. All right, all right. All right. But I understood how I got to Princeton University. I didn't get to Princeton just because I was this, that, and the other. Because you know and I know that for a long time, Princeton University didn't even accept black people. A black, student, a black person couldn't even enroll. Read Judge Bruce Wright's book, Black Robes, White Justice. He was accepted at Princeton University. He showed up because he wrote so well, they thought he was white. And when he showed up, they told him he had to leave. See, many of us, we have degrees today. Uh-oh, uh -oh. it's raining. Oh, shoot. Vote for Larry M. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Oh, they say keep going. Okay. Well, maybe some people should come stand under the. Oh, I'm on. Right. Ask me a question. Maybe it's just a shower. Yeah. Go ahead. What's the question? How is any will? How will my presence, how will my presence in the U.S. Senate be different? It's going to be different because 
I am going to be the strongest voice New Jersey ever had in the United States Senate. The, the, a voice for justice. A, a voice for Medicare for all. One of the things that we've seen in this COVID crisis is all the inequities and inadequacies of our healthcare system. There are 32 advanced industrial countries in the world today. We are the only advanced industrial country that does not offer universal health care for its people. It's time for the United States to move into the 21st century. We need universal health care, Medicare for all in the United States. My campaign, my campaign does not accept money from any industry. We don't accept it from the healthcare industry. We don't accept it from the pharmaceutical industry. We haven't accepted any donations from billionaires. All the donations that I have received, I've received from grassroots people. And that is one of the difference. The difference between myself and Cory Booker, he is a career politician, I'm a career activist. And I will be an activist yeah. in the United States Senate. Yeah. We need Medicare for all. People cannot pay rent on $7.25 an hour. The minimum wage in New Jersey, the minimum wage in the nation, the federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. The state minimum wage is $8.35 an hour. That kind of wage puts people in poverty. It makes them part of the working poor. We must double the minimum wage, $15 an hour for every worker throughout the United States. $15 an hour. But see, we can't stop there. We can't stop there. $15 an hour ain't nothing to throw a party about. And by the time we get to $15 an hour with inflation, that's not gonna be good enough. We need a living wage for all working people in the United States. Right. Yes, sir. My ideas and philosophies are based on those of Martin Luther King. Not just his philosophy of nonviolence. Because when people talk about Dr. King, they only talk about Dr. King as a disciple of nonviolence. He was nonviolent. That was his tactic. There's no argument there. But people leave it there as if that's the only thing that he ever talked about. If you read Dr. King's fifth book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? Go to the appendix. And in the appendix, you will see Dr. King's program for social and economic justice. Everything that we are talking about today, Dr. King talked about in 1966. We, he didn't say Medicare for all, he said universal health care. Today we say UBI, universal basic income, as a, as a way of making a floor so people don't fall into poverty. Dr. King said guaranteed minimum income in that document. Uh, Dr. King talked about a living wage. All the issues, see what happened was, in 1968, the government literally went to war against the civil rights movement and the black power movement in this country. That's what happened. They went to war. Coretta Scott King went into federal court about the assassination of her husband, and in 1999, federal district judge in Atlanta ruled, yes, Martin Luther King was the victim of a conspiracy, and you can look this up, all you gotta do is Google it, of a conspiracy that involved 11 intelligence agencies and the police of Memphis, Tennessee. Why did they want to stop Dr. King? Because he was a civil rights leader? No. They wanted to stop Dr. King for two reasons. On April 4th, 1967, Dr. King gave a speech against the war in Vietnam. He came out against the war in Vietnam. Now, People had come out before the war, before Dr. King. In fact, in 1963, you know John Lewis that's in Congress now? Yeah. He was the president of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1963. 
He was the youth representative to speak at the March on Washington. John Lewis spoke at the March on Washington. But you know what happened? They edited John Lewis's speech before he spoke and took out SNCC's position against the war in Vietnam. And other people, Stokely Carmichael had come in, even Dr. King's own wife, Coretta Scott King, as early as 1966. She was part of women's groups that had come out against the war in Vietnam. So what was the title of Dr. King's speech at the Riverside Church in 1967? We call, we say popularly, why I oppose the war in Vietnam, but that wasn't the title of the speech. The title of the speech was a time to break the silence. Because Dr. King, in essence, had made a deal with LBJ. They made a deal. The civil rights leaders wouldn't talk about the war in Vietnam, and LBJ would ferry the civil rights legislation, the voting rights legislation through Congress. That was the deal. And they did that. that those were the two crowning achievements of the civil rights movement. Well, there were several. There was the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Higher Education Act, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, Medicare, the War on Poverty. All of these came out of the Civil Rights Movement and, and the War on Poverty of that time. But Dr. King was a man of God. And as a man of God, he had to be a man of peace. And Dr. King was wrestling with his conscience. You, you could see that when you read his earlier speeches. You know, I have to ask the people in the crowd here. We got a Martin Luther King holiday, right? Mm, yes. We got a Martin Luther King statue, right? right. Yeah. We got streets named after Dr. King. Mm -hmm. We got schools named after Dr. King. Mm -hmm. I ask you in this audience today, what public school requires, requires one of the six books that Martin Luther King wrote no. to be read by its students? No. 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 See, what sense does it make to have a holiday if we're not going to transfer, transmit the ideas for, for which the man stood? If we have a king holiday, a king monument, king roads, king streets, king schools, some of Dr. King's writings need to be on the curriculum of our public schools throughout yes, the state of New Jersey. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we have something called the Amistad Act, which should make that happen. But Dr. King had, was wrestling with his conscience. So he had to come out against the war in Vietnam. What did he say about Vietnam? He said the Vietnam War was, a, and these are his words, a demonic suction tube. That's his words. A demonic suction tube that was sucking up the money for the war on poverty and using it to fund the war in Vietnam. So Dr. King was wrestling with his conscience and he came out against the war, April 4th, 1967. Isn't it something to think about that a year to the day he was assassinated, April 4th, 1968? Mm -hmm. The other thing is that Dr. King at the end of his life was doing what? He was engaged in the war on poverty. You know what Dr. King says, and where do we go from here, chaos or community? Dr. King said he wanted to bring a million people to Washington, D.C. A million. And these are his words. He said, I want to bring the Negroes from the ghettos because that was a word of currency at the time, the Negroes from the ghettos, the Latinos from the barrios, the Native Americans from the reservations, and the poor whites from Appalachia. That's what Dr. King said. You can read it. It's, go read that book. And they were going to go to Washington and engage in massive civil disobedience until what? Until Congress passed an economic bill of rights. Now some people say, well that sounds like socialism to me. You know who first started talking about an economic bill of rights? FDR. In the 1940s, during his last term, the only president to serve four terms. He died in his fourth term, and then they amended the Constitution so that the president could only serve two consecutive terms. FDR said that we had to put rights other than legal rights in the Constitution. The right to housing, the right to education, the right to realize the fruits of your labor, to benefit from the fruits of your labor, and so on and so forth. Dr. King reiterated this idea. And I believe because of his opposition to the Vietnam War and because he was trying to build a multiracial poor people's movement, 
That's why they assassinated him. You know, I used to be real close with Gil Noble. Any of y'all remember Gil Noble? Yes, yes, Gil Noble yes, that wrote yes, Like It Is? Yes, yes. I mean, not wrote, but yes, produced yes, yes. the television show Like It Is. But toward the end of his life, Gil and I, we used to meet frequently. I know y'all used to see me on the show every now and then, but he and I used to meet right at Panera, over there in Montclair, because he lived in Montclair, and we would talk. You know one of the things that Gil told me in his research? He said, Larry, he said Bobby Kennedy was going to ask Martin Luther King to be his running mate, his vice presidential running mate in 1968. And that's really ironic because Bobby Kennedy had been, when he was the, um, the head of the Justice Department, he had been one of the ones that authorized wiretaps on Dr. King, but he had an epiphany. He had an epiphany. And Gil said that Bobby Kennedy was going to ask Dr. King, and you know, because other people were trying, Spock who ran for president, Benjamin Spock who ran for president, he wanted Dr. King to be his running mate too. But isn't it something that Dr. King was assassinated on April 4th, 1968, and Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in June of 1968? See, these people who are in power, they don't play fair. <laughs> See, we weren't around here talking about the rules and playing fair and all that stuff. When they can't get their way, they take out the gun. They sure do. You know, I think of all the assassinations in, 19, in the 1960s. Mega Evers, we just passed uh, uh, the, the anniversary assassination of Mega Evers. June 12th, I believe it was. Mega Evers and Malcolm X and Martin King and Jack Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy. And you know what I believe? I believe that we have fundamentally been in a holding pattern since 1968. Maybe even not a holding pattern, because from 1968, from the election of Richard Nixon, people have been rolling back the gains of the civil rights movement, the gains of the women's movement, the gains of labor. In fact, it hasn't even just been an attack on civil rights, it's been an attack on the New Deal. And so we've been like in a holding yes, yes, pattern. Yes, yes. You know, and I listen, like if you go back and you listen to speeches that LBJ gave in 1964 at Howard University before he signed the Voting Rights Act, before he signed, so he sounded like a revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't a revolutionary, but it just goes to show you the ethos of those times. It was a time of struggle. People talk about how terrible the 60s were. I think the 60s was some of the best years we ever, ever had, ever had in this country. Now I know people talk about the rebellions and the right. Now look, Larry Ham would have not gone to Princeton University had it not been for the struggle of the civil rights movement in 1960. And some of you in here that have degrees, you wouldn't have been able to go to those schools. Anybody in here on financial aid wouldn't have been able to go to school. The Civil Rights Movement made that possible. There was no EOF before 1966. It didn't exist. There was the GI Bill. And the GI Bill, if you were lucky enough to come home from the war unharmed, you could get a loan for housing and you could get money to go to school. And so Adam Clayton Powell extended the benefits of the GI Bill to the rest of the population. And that is where EOF comes from. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we have lost ground. Black people, poor people, working people, fundamentally are in worse shape today than we were in 1968. Do you know that after World War II, 49% of labor was organized? Today, less than 10% of labor is organized, and most of it is in the public sector. There are twice as many poor people in America today than there were in 1968. In fact, the greatest upward redistribution of wealth in the history of mankind, humankind, has taken place in the last 10 years. There's more concentrated wealth in this society than ever before, and that's a very dangerous characteristic. We need a new New Deal. Some people say we need a Green New Deal. I'm down with that, but I'm really down for a red, black, and green New Deal. <laughs> because if you know 
the history of the New Deal, you know that black people were excluded from. Did you know that? That a lot of black people were excluded from New Deal programs. This is the truth. Look it up. Read, read um, uh, France and Francis Fox, Francis Fox Piven's book, Poor People's Movement, or the other one, Regulating the Poor. We were excluded from many of those problems. Many of the categories of labor that we were in were excluded. So I'm running today not just to be a senator. I'm running today to be a leader in a movement to transform this country. This country is rich enough for every human being to realize their human potential. It's rich enough. We don't have to have poverty. We don't have to have all this. It, it, it can be, these things are not beyond our ability to solve. So I want to be, you ask me how will I be different? You see me marching up and down these streets, I'm gonna be marching up and down the halls of Congress. Yes, you yes, see yes. me sitting in here and there, I might be sitting in on the floor of the Senate because I'm gonna fight for a better world for our children. Yes. Look at our environment. Yes. What kind of world are we gonna bequeath to our children? Yes. A world of polluted air, water that you can't drink, mm -hmm. earth that's tainted, the crops of food can't grow, we are facing an existential crisis. We see it happening before our very eyes. The environmental movement is everybody's movement. You know, because people say, well, police brutality, that's black people's movement. It's not black people, it's everybody's movement. Because the police kill a thousand people a year of all races. They not just brought black, but they're disproportionately black. We're 13% of the population with 38% of the people killed by police and 48%, almost half, of the unarmed civilians killed by the police are black. It's everybody's movement. We, we have to come out of our little silos. And we have to build walls, not just of understanding. Yes, we want understanding. I am for love, yes. But I'm also for children not going to bed hungry at night. I'm also for people not being scared to go to the hospital because they can't pay a bill. There's no reason why we can't have a universal system of health care in this country. There's no reason. Look at our children. Talk about my, my daughters, right? My three daughters are part of a whole generation of young people that are graduating with fifty, sixty, a hundred thousand dollars in student loans. Student loans, it, it would take them forever. They, they'll never move out of their parents' house if they have to send half of their money to the bank every month. If we could bail out the banks and corporations, we can abolish student debt in the United States of America for all young people. And that's, those, are, those are some of the things that I want to do. I want to see a better world. But I don't just want to pray for it. I want to make it happen. I don't just want to give speeches. I want to make things happen. You know, I don't just want to engage in ceremony. I want to see things happen. And I want to fight like hell to make them happen, if I have to. I'm going to stop. <laughs> I'm going to stop right here, take another question. That was supposed to be an answer to a question. <laughs> Any other questions? I know there's some more questions. Yes, sir. Um, small businesses are affected right now by the COVID-19. Yes. What is your take on bringing about economic stimulation with a small business? Well, the, the problem with the stimulus is that it didn't benefit small business. It was supposed to benefit small business. We were told it was going to benefit small business. But the lion's share of the stimulus and relief money went to corporation. It's criminal. Somebody should go to jail. And you That's got right. That, right. Somebody That's should right. go to jail. Right. Because That's these right. programs were supposed to help small business That's and working right. people. Do you know that after they raised the amount of the unemployment check, do you know that there's still people that haven't got this unemployment yes, check yet? Yes, yes. Right. There are still small businesses that applied months ago. Let me tell you something. By the time the small businesses went to get their applications, the big businesses had already taken the money. Now you can verify this. There's nothing that I'm saying today that can't be verified. 
So if I'm in the Senate, I'm going to make sure that if programs are not implemented in compliance with their mission, then somebody is going to jail. That's right. That's right. That's somebody right. is going to jail. That's, right. That's why we can't stop police brutality. That's right. That's right. I, I am for all the reforms that people want to do. I'm for more training. I'm for bias training. I'm for de-escalation training. I'm for residency. I'm for all of these little things that people want to do to stop police brutality. But I got a, a secret for you. They're not going to stop police brutality. Right. 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 Tell them about it. They're not going to stop it. You know what's going to stop police brutality? Mm -hmm. When officers like Chauvin, who murder people in broad daylight in Come front of now. cameras, right. know that they will lose their job, their shield, their gun, their license, their pension, their seniority, and their freedom. That's right. If they murder people unjustly, that's, right. that's, that's, that's right. when it's going to stop. That's right. That's right. That's right. The Supreme Court the other day just turned down. This is when people say voting is not important. That is the most untrue thing. I know a lot of people are alienated from the political system and everything, but look, we got to vote. We fought and died for the right to vote. We have to vote. Even if you go in the voting booth and you just write your own name in there, but you should exercise your right to vote. Look what happened. People said, don't vote. People stayed home. And what happened? We got Trump in office. And what did Trump do? He appointed all these conservative judges to the Supreme Court. You know, and, and, and as a result of that, just the other day, eight cases on qualified immunity came before the Supreme Court. Qualified immunity is the kind of immunity that police officers have that protects them from the same type of prosecution that you or I would face if we committed a crime. And so the Supreme Court justices refuse to hear those cases, so they're not touching qualified immunity. We have to change the laws regarding this. There must be federal laws on this issue that make it clear. Look, nobody doesn't want the police to do their job. We want to, if somebody's in my backyard, I'm gonna call the police, right? We want the police to do their job. This is what we don't want the police to do. You, you got a suspect, put the cuffs on them, put them in the car, take them downtown and book them. Do your job. Your job is not to stomp on people. Your job is not to shoot people in the back that are unarmed. Your job is not to strangle people to death. Your job is not to be judge, jury, and executioner. You are an officer of the law. Your job is to make an arrest, take person downtown to be booked. All this extra stuff they're doing, that's their white racism coming out. Right. That, that, you, know, you know the origins of police, right? Oh, yeah. I know that you didn't expect me to come up to South Orange and talk oh, about these. Yeah. Maybe I should sit down before I lose all my friends. <laughs> but the origins of police come from the slave patrols. Yeah. Yeah. Modern police forces as we know them today evolved from slave patrols. Read Herbert Aptecker's book, Slave Rebellions in Colonial America. There, there's a host of other books you can read on the origin. The Second Amendment that people talk about so much. You know the origins of that? The Second Amendment was put in the Constitution so that uh, South Carolina and Georgia could form militias to put down slave rebellions because that was the main concern that people had at the time. Because black people were rising up, fighting for freedom, even before we got here. We were fighting in Africa, we were fighting on the slave ships, and we were rebelling when we got here. And the only way that they could keep the system of slavery in, in place is with the most unimaginable and horrific force you could ever think of. What was done to us, and today is Juneteenth, by the way. Let me tell you what else I'm for as a senator. I'm for reparations for the descendants of African people. I am for reparations. You know, 245 years of stolen labor in the colonial United States. If we count from the time that slaves were taken by Christopher Columbus, 500 years of slavery in the Western Hemisphere. You know, we're going through a process in this country right now. And that process has us unlearning a lot of things that we were taught. When I was a little boy in school, 
you know, we were taught Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 for many weeks. Yes. He wasn't sea sailing ships that number three. <laughs> Those were slave ships. Columbus took slaves on his first voyage. He enslaved the Arawak, the Taino, the Boricua. These were the indigenous peoples in the Caribbean. And he did terrible, terrible things to them. He was like, well, why are they tearing down the Columbus? If you read Columbus's own diaries, you don't have to read anybody else. Don't, don't even read. Read what Columbus says in his own diaries. He said he would cut off the hands of people that did not bring, bring a thimble full of gold every day. Because that's what they, he, he said, quote, he said, the white man has a sickness. We love gold. So they could actually get gold out of the, the streams and rivers in the beginning. And the Indians had to bring this gold. And if they didn't bring gold, their hands were chopped off. They were flayed. You know what flailing is? That's when you take the skin off of a human being. Beheadings. And roasting people alive. This was Christopher Columbus. And if you don't believe me, because I know some people in here refuse to believe it, if you don't believe me, read Open the Veins of Latin America by Eduardo Galeano. Read Eric Williams' Capitalism and Slavery. Read Eric Williams' From Columbus to Castro. It's all there. It's a matter of record. It's just that these things are not taught. This is why there's an Amistad Act. In 2003 in New Jersey, we passed an Amistad law that said that black studies must be taught in all social studies classes in all public schools, elementary and secondary in the state of New Jersey. If I'm U.S. Senator, we'll have a national Amistad law. Yes, 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 a national yes, Amistad yes, yes. law. Yes, yes, because yes. our children need to know the truth. Black children and white children. Both need to know, not black, white, red, yellow. We need to know everybody's experience. I remember the first time I, when, when I went to Princeton the first time, because you know I left, right, and I came back. I went to Princeton the first time, I took a course. And, and I had to read a two volume set called To Serve the Devil. And I believe the, the author was Paul Jacobs. And you know, I came out of the, the ghetto, if that's what we called it at that time. Now it's just the city of Newark. <laughs> You know, so my whole experience was in the black world. I didn't, I didn't know about other people's oppression. But I took this course and I read those books and I was amazed to see how Jews and Irish and Japanese and Native Americans and Hawaiians and all kind of people had faced some type of oppression at some point in history, you know? We should know each other's experience. Yes, yes, and, yes. and that's an antidote to racism. Yes. You know, if, if we don't provide an antidote, the racism will get worse. Dylan Roof goes into Mother Bethel, and Mother Emmanuel, and kills nine people. A racist goes into synagogue, racists go into synagogues and are shooting people down. They're going into the Walmart, killing Latinos. It's, it's terrible. It's, it's almost as if we didn't fight against Hitler. We fought a war, World War II, against Nazism. And now we have a president who makes common cause, who says these are wonderful people. <laughs> you know? So we have to make a change. We have, it's not just yeah. about electing yeah. people. Off. Elect, electing people off is just part of it. People want it easy. Look, you're not going to have it both ways. Some of you want it both ways. You want to elect people and then go back home to your lives and business as usual. That's not going to, it's not going to wash. It's not going to wash. We all have to get involved. Now, we all can't be involved in the same way. We have different talents. We have different uh, personalities. We have different uh, uh, abilities and limits and so on and so forth. But everybody has to be involved. Everybody has to be involved. And we can't just talk about it. We gotta talk about it, but we can't leave it at talk. We gotta take action. We gotta build a better world together. This country is the richest country in the world. 
there's no reason for us to have half the population living in poverty. There's no reason for three men to have more wealth than half the American population. That's crazy. You asking for it. You know what happened in the French Revolution? That's the last time they had that kind of inequality was in the French Revolution. You know what happened, right? Everybody knows. Take any sociology course. Inequality builds social unrest. It's as simple as that. We need to be a better world. We need to have a better world for ourselves and our children. Are there any other questions? Yes, a question. I thought y'all was tired. Yes. All right. Yes. 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 And my second question is, what's your stance on legalization of marijuana as a legal Okay, the easy question first. I'm for full legalization of marijuana. Now, I know that might not play well with some people, but we can't keep filling up these jails with people just because they were smoking rap marijuana. It costs $60,000 a year to imprison a person. We have 4.7% of the world's population. We have 25% of the world's prisons. We have more people in prisons than any other country on the face of the earth. We have more people in prison than China, Iraq, Iran combined. We are a garrison state. We have so many prisons in this country and it's not sustainable. Prisons don't make money. There are people that exploit prison labor but prisons function on tax dollars. And there ain't enough tax dollars to keep building prisons. I'm telling you, we have already hit the wall. So I am for legalization of marijuana, and I would even consider examining decriminalization of some other drugs. We gotta handle this. It's not a law enforcement problem, it's a health problem. And we have to treat it as a health problem. The health problem. So that's the easy part. The second part is reparations. That's a more involved question. You, what were some of the things you mentioned? You said um, money to HBCUs. What was it? What else? I just heard that Netflix gave four million dollars to the Okay. Yes. Yes. You know what that's called? That's called charity. And charity is a good thing. I'm for charity. But that's not reparations. Reparations. Everybody put your big ear up now like Pee Wee Herman. Yep. <laughs> reparations is restitution for labor stolen during the enslavement of black people in this country. That's reparations. Anything else is not reparations. Increasing welfare is not reparations. Unemployment insurance is not reparations. Building more housing, although more housing must be built, is not reparations. Reparations is restitution and compensation for the stolen labor of Africans in this country. Our ancestors. Yes, yes, yes. This is this is Juneteenth. This is Juneteenth. Where does the idea of reparations come from? Juneteenth, we celebrate emancipation, but where does the idea of reparations come from? First of all, it's as old as civilization. You read the Roman wars, and Rome sometime, when they conquered certain civilizations, made reparations to certain countries as a means of making peace. They would conquer people and maybe take some land from the rich and redistribute it to the peasants. That's, that was a form of reparations. Abraham Lincoln, in his second speech of 1864, by the way, Abraham Lincoln did not win New Jersey. He did not win New Jersey in 1860, and he did not win New Jersey in 1864. When Abraham Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation September 22, 1862, becoming effective January 1st, 1863, the state legislature of New Jersey nullified Lincoln's power to emancipate slaves in this state. When the 13th Amendment was passed in 1865, you needed a three-fourths majority of the states. There were 36 states at that time. You needed 27 states. New Jersey was not in the 27 state majority to ratify the 13th Amendment. Slavery was here. 
It wasn't just down south. The most active slave port on the East Coast wasn't even in the South. It was New York City. The next most active slave port was Perth Amboy, New Jersey. The next most active slave port after that was Camden, New Jersey. At the time of the Civil War in 1860, there were, there were nearly 20,000 registered slaves in the state. This state, even though it was in the Union, was very much sympathetic to the South because the South sent the cotton up here and we turned it, turned it into cloth and sent it back down there. Money was being made here in New Jersey. In fact, you know one of the things that New Jersey specialized in? Did you know that there was such a thing as slave cloth? Yes. That even the cloth that enslaved people had to wear, you talk about indicia of slavery, even the cloth that enslaved people wore was a different kind of cloth. It was more akin to burlap. Anybody ever know what a burlap bag is? Slave cloth made in New Jersey. So, when the Civil War was fought, Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation as a war document. The whole purpose of the proclamation was to get black men to enroll in the Union Army. Because how many people have read the Emancipation Proclamation? You, know, you should ask your children too, did you read the Emancipation Proclamation in school? I'm, I'm astounded at how many students have never read the Emancipation Proclamation. It only freed slaves. Read it, read the document. In the states, parishes, and counties deemed to be in rebellion. It didn't free slaves in states that were part of the Union. See, we think all the states that had slavery were in the South, and all the states that didn't have slavery were in the North. Some of the Northern states had slavery, but they threw in with the Union. So the Emancipation Proclamation didn't cover those states. So Lincoln said in 1864 that there had to be some restitution to the quote unquote bondsmen for quote unquote stolen labor. When General Sherman goes south, how many heard of Sherman? Yeah. Right. You would do better in the south to say the name of Abraham Lincoln than William Tecumseh Sherman. They hate Sherman in the south because they say Sherman burned down the South. Sherman said, I'm going to show you the cost of rebellion. And he meant to win the war. Yep. Sherman goes South, and in January of 1864, Sherman issues General Order Number 15. With the stroke of a pen, really, Sherman expropriated the land, 400,000 acres from slave masters, and gave it to the enslaved just like that. Because they knew the enslaved people had to have a stake in the country. You know what Frederick Douglass said after emancipation, after 1865? He said, we were free to starve. That's what Frederick Douglass said. So there had to be a stake. So Sherman issues General Order Number 15. Thaddeus Stevens, who was one of the radical Republicans, sees General Order Number 15, issues H.R. 29, would give 40 acres and $50 to every formerly enslaved person. H.R. 29 is passed by the Congress, is passed in the House, and a version is offered in the Senate, but what happens? Abraham Lincoln is assassinated on April 9th. Who becomes president? Andrew Johnson. Where is he from? Tennessee. Where lies his sympathy with the South? As soon as Johnson becomes president, by the way, Johnson was also impeached. As soon as Johnson becomes president, what's the first thing he does? Issues an executive order rescinding general order number 15 and saying that all the land that had been distributed to the enslaved had to be returned. They sent a union general 
who fought to end slavery back to the South to take the land. By the way, his name was Howard, of which Howard University is named. General O.O. O. Howard. But anyway, that's where reparations come from. The idea that African people should have reparations. It was an act of Congress. And because of the Electoral College, because of the Compromise of 1877, Johnson becomes president and vetoes um, H.R. 29 and the Senate version of it. So we never, we never got reparations. So this is where it comes from. So I support reparations, the long and the short of it. I just want to make, sure, make this clear, because people say a lot of things are reparations when they're not. They are, if we build housing for the poor, that's a wonderful thing. We should build housing for the poor, but that's not reparations. This country has given reparations. When Ronald Reagan was president, Reparations were given to Japanese. Exactly $20,000 were given to the families of Japanese that had been interned in concentration camps, by the way, by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I don't know if people, because we say Roosevelt was a wonderful guy, right? He was on some things, but he interned. It was, it was his executive order that interned Japanese Americans. You know? So we've given reparations to. Other peoples around the world, African people, should receive reparations. Yes. Oh, any more questions? I'm wearing people out here. Yes. Is that Jerry? No, it's not oh, Jerry. Okay. But um, I'm wondering, what would happen if our blue chip, all American high school athletes was to go to HBCUs? You ever thought about that? Hey, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, it'd be, it would be nice for it to happen. I don't know. Shake up. Would it shake up some? Uh, he he said, "What money? would happen if all the 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 great college athletes, high school, high school athletes, Blue would chip, go to HBCUs?" American. Yeah, and that'd probably be a good thing. I I, I have no who argument. Would, who would force them to go to HBCUs? Right, you know they're going with the money, right? <laughs> well, would, it, would it help the colleges? Though? That's what I'm saying. Uh, would it would it change the whole? Dynamic it might change of some things. NCAA. I, I, it might change some things. It might. It might. Yeah. You know. I just think they should give Colin Kaepernick his job back. That's what I think they should do. Give Colin Kaepernick his job back. You know, that's one of the things they should do. Yes. I'm only going to take three more questions. Yes, one. Party discipline. What do you think about that? What? Party discipline. Party discipline? As opposed to voting your conscience. I don't know. I think people should always be able to listen to their conscience. I mean, party discipline, that's what they have in countries. Yeah, so, you know, they just, you know, nothing gets done. I, I see what you're saying. In some situations, we need party discipline, like when Democrats don't vote for Medicare for all. <laughs> we should have party discipline then, right? You know, so I think at, at a certain level, institutional party discipline is good. That's why they have, every party has a whip, right? That's why they call it the whip, right? To whip the members in line. Next question, what was it? Uh, what have you done currently as far as your activism where it meets compromise? Because I know that you consider that you have to compromise with all classes. Uh, what does that look like as far as compromise? When the justice to justice you know, Right. I, I've thought about Oh, I, I have to be transparent. You're going to make me be transparent. Because you're going to know that I spoke here and said certain things. And you're going to say, Larry, you know you said this, right? For instance, she said, what about compromise? I want to see the military budget cut. I would like to say, hypothetically, cut the military budget 25%. But I might not be able to get enough votes to cut it 25%. I might get enough votes to cut it 10%. So I would compromise in a situation like that. The point is to try to cut the budget. I would initially offer the bill that I wanted. But remember, for a bill to become law, you got to get a majority of people to vote for it. And that's why often the bills are not, the laws are not as effective as we think they should be because they go in this meat grinder and they come out the other end. It's not really what we wanted, but that's the process of compromise. You have to choose, right? You have to choose whether you want to get a little something done or nothing done. So I think the way I would do it would be to offer up the exact bills that I want and then work 
it through to try to get as much support as I can. And if I have to compromise somewhat, I'll compromise somewhat, but I'm not going to compromise away my principles. Yes. Hey, Larry, brings it in the house. Uh, how you doing? From yes, years yes, ago. yes. My uh, fellow day. alum. Oh, wonderful to see you, my classmate. You always radical. Larry's one that took over Nassau Hall at Princeton. That's right. We all were with him to get to Princeton to divest from South Africa. And my parents were saying, please don't get arrested. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got to go to graduate school. Yes. Which I'm, glad, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. We are all proud of you. Thank you. Now, I want to know, first of all, how's the money situation? Because, you know, Cory Booker Thank you, Jesus. is like <laughs> lit. And also, part two, you know, I have a lot of questions, yes. Mark. Do you think we'll be able to get rid of the Electoral College? Because that is how Al Gore lost, that is how Trump lost, and this is how the Republicans might steal the election again because of the swing states and the Electoral College, which is based on three-fifths of a man. I think that if Slavery. we um, maintain the majority in the House, we flip the Senate and get a majority in the Senate, I think it is possible that we could abolish the Electoral College. There was a lot of support for abolishing the Electoral College in the 70s. In fact, they almost did it in the 70s, but they were like a couple of votes short. I think that everybody sees the folly of the Electoral College now. You know, you know what the Electoral College is, right? That's the people who really choose the president. What we do is really symbolic. It's 530 people, the number equal to the number of people in Congress that make a decision in December to choose the real president. There may have been good reasons for that during the colonial era, but today we have mass education, we have educated people, we have instant telecommunications. There's no reason why we can't have or should not have direct election of the president of the United States. The Electoral College is a remnant of the era of slavery. It was another institution designed to give the slave-holding colonies more power than the non-slave holding colonies. The Senate is another remnant of that period. I mean, think about it, right? New York has 18 million people. Rhode Island has 500,000 people. Rhode Island has two senators. New York has two senators. I mean, is that really fair? <laughs> I mean, think about it. You know, it used to be the Senate was elected by state legislatures. It was not popularly elected. So it was a kind of step in the right direction to have a popularly elected Senate. But we need to abolish the Electoral College. I think it can be done. I think it, it can be done in our lifetime. I was very interested in seeing that even Hillary Clinton came out uh, toward the end of last year and called for the abolition of the Electoral College. Because the truth of the matter is that Republicans know that they cannot win elections. They can't win popular elections. They can't do it on the popular vote. The, all the last three or four Republican presidents, you know, were either the Supreme Court gave them the election or they got it through the Electoral College or they stole it, they stole it. you know, or they stole it. <laughs> and they know, I mean, Trump says these things from time to time. He said, vote by mail? No, no. He said it. He said it himself. We'll never win if we have vote by mail. <laughs> He, that's what he's good for, good for saying the truth every now and then, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, on the walls of uh, the prison in Trenton, one of the oldest prisons in the country, it says that those who are feared for their crime may learn fear of the law and be useful. And throughout this country, and particularly what came to me a few last year, my children went to high school in Massachusetts, you see all these empty mill buildings, shoe factories, empty. When they hollowed those out, that's when they built prisons in lieu of that. And when they make them useful in prison, they, they make military insignia, they, make, they made, they may not be making them today, but they made McDonald's uniforms. So you take away jobs from a community, you force prisoners to, to, to do them under same conditions that we talk about when we talk about slavery, and people are talking about prison abolition, but if they, the military budget is swollen, if they gave people good jobs in those same buildings to produce, the, 
when the, with that uh, that thing that could have made masks when right. we first needed them. Right. That, whatever that act was called. There's so many things that would take money that would take some money from the uh, military budget. Right. Some money from the swollen police budgets right. and make it useful in communities. Just right. from the from a labor standpoint, without looking at the uh, aspects of therapeutic aspects that, of arts or whatever else. Right. But, there, but that uh, car, that carceral state that we have allowed to mushroom right. is another center of power. When when Trump came in, Obama was tamping it down. So right. you might have gotten some kind of change, right. and people who want to change the Loretta Lynch had swap. issued an order and saying no more right privatized prisons. Right. And so as as senator, what would you do about the carceral state? Well, the first thing is I'd go back and we've uh, passed laws saying no more private prisons, no more private detention centers, no privatization of, of prisons and jails. People should not be profiting off of prisons. The, 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 the second thing, um, that's very important, we must abolish slave labor. We have slave labor in our prisons. Do you know what the wage is right now for a prisoner? Because they have a wage for, for prison. No, it's not, it's like a dollar 85 cent. It's, a, it's about a dollar 85 cent. That's the prison wage. You know why, a, 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 a day. You know why we can have a prison wage? Because the 13th Amendment says the abolition of slavery, except for those convicted of a crime. Read it. Read the 13th Amendment. Read it yourself. That's the issue. We must, one of the things we must do in terms of, as you said, the That's carceral mean. state, as opposed to incarcerating the carceral state, is we must amend the Constitution. We must revise the 13th Amendment or put another amendment in to say abolition of all slavery, period. We should not have slave wages. The Fortune 500 corporations are all in prisons using slave labor. They're all there. Them prisoners make, they don't just make license plates. Do you know they're doing telemarketing? The prisoners are used to do telemarketing? For court, really? This would be like a comedy, right? If, 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 you know, it's so fantastic, it's almost unbelievable. But the American Express, companies that you are very familiar with, use prison labor. So we need to amend or offer a counter amendment to the 13th Amendment to abolish all slavery, period. Not just because you're convicted of, you shouldn't be a slave because you're a prisoner. You still shouldn't be a slave. You still have human rights. The second thing is, prisoners should at least, at least make a living wage. Uh, um, excuse me, a minimum wage. The, the, the prison wage should be raised from a dollar eighty-five. It's, I think it's a dollar eighty-five cent uh, in New Jersey. It should be raised to um, eight dollars and thirty-five cent an hour. I mean, one of the reasons we have. Me, I'm calling you, Senator. If you would allow me. Right. They. No, we shouldn't have a prison minimum wage. Right. We should, we should have those jobs for regular working people. Right, right. But I'm saying that prisoners are exploited. Prison labor is being exploited. If they use prison labor, there shouldn't be a difference between a prisoner's wage and a regular working person's wage. That's what I'm saying. If, there's gonna, if you're going to put prisoners to work, they should make a decent wage. i tell you the other thing I'm opposed to, and I'm probably not going to get <laughs> Another thing I'm opposed to is this multiple life sentences. Do you know in Sweden, if you're sentenced to a life sentence, that's it. You get one life sentence, 25 years. To me, these multiple life sentences are really death sentences in disguise. We got people in jail like Mumia Abu-Jamal, Sundiata Kohli, every time, they've already more than served the years that they were sentenced to. But every time they go up for parole, they're denied parole. And they're going to die in prison. That's the intent, for them to die in prison. We shouldn't be like that. If you get a life sentence, you get a one life sentence, and that's it. It's a life sentence. You serve 25, 30, whatever the life sentence is, that's it. You don't serve it twice. You don't serve it three times. You serve it one time. And, and that should be it. 
because people have been denied parole for five and six times. And, it, and, and that's why we have an aging prison population. I go, I speak in prisons. I've spoken in Northern State and other prisons, and you would be surprised when people are coming to the program, they coming in wheelchairs, they coming in walkers, they coming on crutches. You know, it's crazy some of the stuff that we're, we're, we're doing with prisons. There had to be some restitution. My people said, be quiet, don't say anything. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for giving me a chance right. to talk to you. I hope I didn't put you to sleep.